All right. So a few technical difficulties today. We had a, a, a demon in the wires, so we just rebuked it, and it worked great. <laughs> um, so uh, the past, I think, four weeks now, we've been, we've been talking about uh, uh, several kind of disjointed messages, but all that I felt like the Lord had said uh, to talk about. Um, and this week, I felt like he's really uh, pulling what we've been talking about together. Um, and really, we, we've talked a lot about your mental life and your mentality. And so I wanted to finish uh, really what we're talking about with this uh, idea, uh, not of what we need to get away from, but really what we need to become, if that makes sense. So are you all with me? Okay. So if you're taking notes, mental notes, whatever kind of notes you take, um, I would encourage you to write this down that today we're talking about uh, sons, not servants. So are y'all with me? Sons, not servants. So I'm going to pray uh, and then we'll jump into it. So God, we love you. Uh, we thank you and we praise you. And just pray right now, God, uh, that you would speak. God, that we would uh, open our hearts to you and hear exactly what you have for us. I pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Just lower that a little bit. Okay, so uh, sons, not servants. Obviously, uh, uh, last week uh, we talked quite a bit about uh, the, the servant mentality um, and really what that looks like in our lives. Um, and as I prayed this week, I really felt very strongly that God wants to uh, encourage us to take up responsibility uh, with, without fear of the consequences. And we're going to talk a lot about that today, but where he, he started with me this week was Romans 8.15, and it said, uh, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And I love this word, Abba, because it literally translates to daddy. Um, and and it, this verse is so cool to me because it says you're not going to fall back into fear. In other words, you were taken out of fear when you got to know God as daddy. And the spirit of adoption that he gave you means that you don't have to go back to living in fear. And, and the question becomes, okay, what kind of fear are we talking about? And the fear is this. It's a fear of punishment. And if you have a good daddy, you're willing to try new things without fear of punishment. You're willing to take on what he's given you without fear of punishment. And so today, I want to be very clear that we are not uh, slaves. We're sons. And yes, there's, there's times where Paul talks about, you know, I'm a slave to the gospel, but that's because it's what he devoted himself to, not because uh, he had no control over his life. And, and the truth is, as sons, it's an even a better work that we put ourselves to. The other part of this is when you are a son, you take full responsibility for the fruit that your labor yields. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. As a servant, if you're working for someone, the, the amount of profits that you give them is almost irrelevant to what you are compensated for. Are y'all following me? But as a son, everything above, like the baseline where you're making money is profit. Are y'all following me? So as a son, you're going to take a higher level of responsibility because the rewards are higher. Are y'all following? So because the rewards are higher, so is the responsibility. And so really the call today is don't be a servant who doesn't care about doing the best that you can. Be a son because yes, the responsibility is greater, but God wants you to call him daddy. In other words, God doesn't want you to be afraid of what's going to happen if you mess up. He doesn't want you to, to be afraid of him. So with that in mind, I'm going to read uh, quite a bit of scripture today. Most of it was written by Paul, because uh, this guy, I mean, he's just the best. Uh, we're going to touch a little bit on uh, the word elect and kind of what that looks like and why I, I believe uh, that that refers much more to people who accept the call as a son than it does to salvation. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But Galatians 4, 1 through 8 says this. Uh, now I'm saying, so long uh, as the heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, even though he's the owner of everything. Instead, he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also when we were under age, we were subservient to the basic principles of this world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent out his son, born of a woman, born under 
the law, to free those under the law so we might receive adoption as sons. Now, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts who cries out, Abba, Father. Okay, that was a lot to digest. Very simply, this passage is about before salvation, you were under the laws of this world. After salvation, you were given a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father, and the call is take up your sonship. You're not under the law anymore, but take up responsibility for the way that you lead your life. Now, I, I, I want to make a clarification here because uh, so often uh, I, I don't feel like we can be clear enough about this subject. You can be a child of God and not be walking out the authority that sonship or daughterhood carries with it. Does that make sense? And that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about stewarding what you've been given. And in this passage, it said that when the son is under age, he's still subservient to the managers who've put in charge, who are hired servants. And I want to be very clear that in your Christian walk, it's so important that you recognize at what point in your journey you're at. Are you at the point where God's saying, I want you to take hold of this? Or are you at the point where God's saying, I just want you to be obedient to the person that's in front of you? Are y'all following? Now, the other thing I wanted to point out is I, I, I love this picture that Paul paints, uh, is that uh, God sent his spirit, the spirit of his son, into our hearts, which cries, Abba, Father. In other words, God sent the Holy Spirit into your life to let you know that it's okay to call him daddy. Are y'all following me? Because, like, that's really good stuff. God sent the Holy Spirit to let us know that he wants an intimate relationship where we view him as daddy. Verse 7 of Galatians 4 says this, For you're no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, an heir through God. But at that time when you did not know God, you served those who were by nature not gods at all. Cool. it's really funny that you came this week. I had no idea you were coming, and I prepared this all beforehand. I'm like, man, we already talked about all this. Um, so, really quick, I want to make something very clear, that we are destined to rule eternally. Now, there is an amount to which uh, the, the, the heavenly beings uh, uh, manage and, and do things in the world. Now, I have not seen in scripture where it makes super clear that they have authority to rule other than what was taken. So like the demons obviously rule in a way, principalities and powers. And it talks about, you know, in Daniel, it talks about uh, uh, Babylon the Great. And there's, there's a whole bunch of references in scripture, but I've never seen one where God puts a, a heavenly angel in position to rule over you. But that doesn't mean that they're not there to help us along, if that makes sense. Are y'all following me? So from what I see in scripture, there's, there's kind of two words that really stick out, and I, I want to make it very clear, and then we'll, we'll keep going. The first is Elohim, which I believe is best translated to spirit. It refers to uh, Samuel when he's called up by the median, uh, by Saul. It says that his Elohim was coming out of the ground, his spirit was coming out of the ground. And it also most of the time refers to angelic beings and also God is referred to as Elohim. But he's the most high Elohim, if that makes sense. So whenever it refers to God, number one God, it's the most high spiritual being. Are y'all following me? And so the, the word he used here when it says that uh, those that we served were not gods by nature at all, the word is Theon, okay? And that word I have literally only found it in the word where it refers to God the Father. In other words, there's a difference between the description here than the description of spiritual beings. Does that make sense? The word used here refers to God specifically and we as his heirs in a different way than spiritual beings. This is very important to recognize that our sonship is differentiated even in the grammar used in the Bible. We have a different kind of sonship to the Lord. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says it this way, For all who are led by the Spirit of God, we just talked about this, the Spirit is the one who tells us we can call God Daddy. So all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We read that at the beginning. 
The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay. Now, I mentioned this before. This is where I get the idea that our communication with God and our direct communication happens between our spirit and the Holy Spirit because they bear witness together. And so the reason our connection with God was restored was because our spirit was restored when we were saved. Our spirit was brought back to life, and now our spiritual connection to God, a spiritual being, is once again flowing. And now our spirits bear witness together. Verse 17 And if children, then heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Okay, now I'm going to touch on this briefly. I'm not going to touch very much uh, about it. Uh, But what the Lord has in front of you, like your calling and what he's he's calling you to, is going to be very unfun, and that's part of it. Like, I think sometimes as Christians, we can, we, can, uh, we can say, oh, you know, God's with you in the hard times, but not necessarily be like, no, like, this is like 100% part of what it is, and you get extra glory for suffering the way Jesus did. In a minute, we're going to, uh, or not in a minute, at the end, we're going to read uh, about how we have the privilege to carry on the same fight that Jesus fought. And that's a fight in the spiritual. Are y'all following me? Now, this is very important because to to stop thinking like a slave, you have to start recognizing there's a bigger picture than the battle that's in front of you. You know, as a son, you're going to plot out a war because your daddy's the king. Your daddy's running the war effort. And so if you want to participate and be an heir, then you need to start recognizing that there's more than just the job in front of you, the battle in front of you. You know, when I was a a waiter, uh, God was was totally working selfishness out of me. Um, and it was really funny because uh, if, if you've ever served a, at a restaurant, like been an actual server, at the end of your shift, you have to clean your section. And so typically you have two or three tables and you clean your section. Well, at one particular restaurant I worked at, they were like crazy about this. And they would make you uh, get underneath like the booths and wipe it down, which is pretty typical. But then they would take like a flashlight and they would shine it underneath. And if they could see any dust, they would make you do it again. Like they were like intense. And what I recognized when I was doing that job was not only is there a purpose behind why they were doing that, but more there was a purpose behind why God had put me there. And every night after I would finish my section, I would just feel like the gentle thing of like, maybe I should go help someone else with their section. And so every night when I would get off, I would go help one person. And I was kind of like, like mad about it the whole way. Cause I was like, come on, God, like, I just want to go home. And, and I got to have so many awesome conversations with people about the Lord because they're like, man, what the heck are you doing? Why are you helping me? Because like, I didn't know him. I was just like, hey, man, you want help? They're like, yeah, I want help. And I got to have these awesome conversations. One girl, she was so lost that literally I've never talked to her before. And we, I sit down and I start helping her clean stuff. And she's like totally telling me her life story and you know what she's insecure about and why she sleeps around and all kinds of stuff. And I was just like, I don't even know what this is all about. <laughs> But I was doing what the Lord had for me, and he was teaching me something, and it's that the character that he was building then was for the life that I'm leading today. But it was was to see a bigger picture that I wasn't just doing this table to help this person. I was building a character that would sustain me through what was to come. Are y'all following? Now, this is so, so important that we recognize uh, the larger battle in front of us. Now, our inheritance, obviously, is to rule a new creation. And we've, we've talked about that obedience is uh, how we show love to God, and it's how we go up in the ranks, really, of heaven, is the better you are at obeying God, the more authority he's going to give you. You know, Jesus, when he found himself to be a human, made himself obedient to the point of death. Then he was given the name above every name. And we've talked about that before, and I want to make very clear that that's the same thing we're talking about here. The difference is we're just talking about looking at the responsibilities in your life and saying, how am I going to make these responsibilities and the way I carry them out obedient to God? This is so important that we recognize that when you take on a responsibility that God's called you to do, then the fruit is a blessing to you, but also the obedience gets you to a place where you can better serve God. 
Now, I have, I have two basic, uh, very simple points, um, and, and they're, they're not complicated at all. I guarantee you'll remember them. The first one is this. It's you have to stop thinking like a slave. Galatians 1.5 says it this way. Am I now trying to win people's approval or God's? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I love this so much. This is so good. Because really what Paul is saying is, if in any way in your life you're trying to please someone, you're doing it wrong. And you, really, you're not even serving Jesus if your goal is to please people. This is such fantastic news for us. Like, because people are so hard to please, it's like it's way easier to please God. You just do your best to do what he's asking. And since he's your daddy, he'll meet you the rest of the way. Like, I've, I've said this before, but I, I love the example is when a kid starts to walk and they walk a few steps and then they fall over, the dad doesn't run up and like slap them. And be like, what are you doing? Why, why would you fall over? Like, they're just learning to walk. It's the same way with God. And when he calls you to take a step into an area you've never stepped before, his expectation is not that you'll know exactly how to walk. It's that you'll take a few steps and that he'll be ready to catch you when you start to stumble. This is so important that we stop thinking like a slave because what does a slave think? They think I've been given a task and if I mess up, I'm going to be punished. You have to stop thinking like a slave. Going on to verse 15 and 16 in Galatians 1, it says, But when God, who set me apart from birth, called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me uh, that I would proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with a human. And I was laughing about this because this is kind of funny. Obviously, we know uh, uh, Paul, who was Saul, on the road to Damascus encounters Jesus. And then I don't know if we understand the timeline here, but he goes in for three years, does not start ministry. Not consulting with humans, and even when he was blind, Ananias was sent to him, but he, he really didn't want to go. But you don't see Paul going and seeking people's approval. Like when he encounters Peter, that's just, pretty much every time there's contention. Like there's respect because they both know that the other one's been called, but there's definite contention. They didn't agree on very much. And so often in the church, we're like, man, if my church leader... Pfft, if he doesn't think what I'm doing is good, that's it's not good. Church leaders aren't the voice of God. They're just not. And this is so important to recognize that if your church leader tells you something contrary to what the Lord is saying, your church leader is wrong. This is so important. Paul says, when God called me, I didn't go looking for what people thought about it. Instead, for three years, I let God pour into me everything that he had. And so often when we get some sort of news, it doesn't matter if it's from God or people, we start like, you know, my, my mom says that women, like they form their army, you know, they go call on all their friends. They're like, you won't believe what she did. And they're like, oh, I can't believe it. And it's so funny that we do that. And, and Paul says, no, no, no. When you get any kind of news, don't go look for people's opinions. And that's not to say that there isn't wisdom in many counselors, because the word does say that. But what Paul is pointing out here is when God gives you a call, you shouldn't seek to please people with it. You should just allow him to tell you what that's going to look like. And when he says go, you should leap. Are y'all following? Because this is really good stuff. Now, the other part of this is I, 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 I don't want to be rude in any sense, uh, but I, I do want to be clear is that uh, the servants of this world will never understand why you as a son are so valued. They're going to think themselves the authority on matters that you specialize in and that they're ignorant of. So what do you do? You listen to your father and you do what he says. This is so important because, uh, you know, we talked about that when the, the heir is under age, he is under the management of the hired servants. However, he is the heir. And one day, he's going to step into something that the servants never could. Are y'all following me? This is so important that we recognize our role in God's plan. Now, my second point, and like I said, they're very simple. The first one is stop thinking like a slave. The, 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 the second one is start thinking like a son. 
Now this is the part where we're going to get into a little bit of what I mentioned earlier about the elect. And this is so important. Uh, never read the Bible and one passage and go, oh man, that passage seems like really confusing. And then just like leave it there and let somebody else tell you what it means. Like go look at the Bible as a whole. Go read everything you can possibly find and, and read what other people have to say because other people can have good things to say. But don't take every conclusion they come to as fact. Okay, are y'all with me? Okay. So the elect. Now, the, the, there's several verses in the Bible that talk about this. I'm going to point to one specifically where it gives the two words that I think are most important to, to recognize. Uh, the, the passage is Matthew 22, uh, 14. Or really, 22 has the parable. Verse 14 has both the words. So the parable is uh, the, there was a bridegroom who had invited a bunch of people to his wedding and had sent out a bunch of servants to go invite him. Now the servants went out, invited all the people, and several of them said no, and then several of them took the servants and murdered them. Super messed up. And then the bridegroom goes, okay, well fine, they're not worthy to come, go out and invite everybody. And so they go out and invite everybody, and a whole bunch of people come in, but then one guy shows up without his wedding garments on. And this is so important because he shows up and then there's uh, an illustration of what hell's going to be like. Is the, the, the bridegroom walks up to him and goes, dude, why aren't you wearing your wedding garments? And he literally, the, the word says, I'll pull it up here. It says in verse 8 of Matthew 22, it says, and he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now, that is what we're talking about in regards to people who are saved and not saved, is that you literally get to heaven and you don't even know how you got there. You're just like, man, I showed up. This is so important because we're going to read a verse here in a second about putting on righteousness. But really, this is very simple. And I, I don't want this to be confusing at all because Matthew 22, 14 says, for many are called, but few are chosen. And all of us kind of like, like clench up a little bit and we're like, whoa, like that sounds a little bit like God's being a little choosy. And God is being choosy, but not in regards to salvation. It's to something else. So, in, in regards to this guy who's thrown out, it's very simple. He waltzed into the bridegroom ceremony having no idea what he was walking into or who, who he was walking uh, to, to meet with. That is why he's thrown out and there's the allusion to hell. It's because he may have showed up, but he wasn't changed. Are y'all following me? Because that's a really good thing. Like, so you don't have to be afraid because when you experience God, you change. That guy didn't change. Are y'all following me? Because I read that and I was like, God, this, that doesn't seem good. You just like toss that guy out and he accepted the invitation. Nobody else accepted the invitation. He did. But it's just like when Jesus said, in that day, many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, and I'll say to them, flee from me for I never knew you. Same thing. It's that they showed up going, oh yeah, time to party. But they never changed. They never put on what God had for them. Now the other verse I want to point out so that we understand this elect principle, and then I'll define these two words for us, uh, is Romans 8, 26 through 30. Now Romans 8 and 9 are the main like ground foundation principles for any Calvinistic beliefs. Uh, and, and we're just going to read it. And it's going to be pretty clear that it, it makes no sense. So verse 26 says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray as we ought to, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that, uh, that he might be the for firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Okay. So verse 29 is the part where we get into the foreknowledge and predestined. And I know those can be scary words. But it's very simple. What word comes first, predestined or foreknew? Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Okay, let's take another verse and compare it. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpieces created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which Christ prepared in advance for us to do. 
In other words, God prepared good things for you. And when the word says, for those he foreknew, he predestined, what he's really saying is, for those that God knew were going to choose to serve him, he made a way for them to do good works. That has nothing to do with God making any decisions. Nowhere in here does it talk about God deciding any kind of salvation. It says, I knew you were going to choose me, so I predestined that you would do great things. That's God being a planner. That's not God being a, a, a judge and deciding who gets to go to heaven and who gets to go to hell. Are y'all following me? Now, I'm not going to get into Romans 9. We've talked about it before. Uh, but I want to be very clear about this principle. Is God knows who's going to be saved. Like, he's, he's omniscient. He knows everything. But that doesn't mean that he chooses. Like, knowledge of something and actions by it, like, not the same thing at all. Like, I can know that a lifelong criminal is most likely going to go and commit more crimes, but until he commits those crimes, I can't punish him, right? Same exact principle here. So, uh, we're, we're going to hop back to Matthew twenty two fourteen and define these two words. For many are called and few are chosen. Are you all with me? Okay. Many are called and few are chosen. So, so, so really, the way to understand this is a whole bunch of people are called. Everybody's called. Few show up, fewer got dressed. And those few that got dressed are the ones who have actually changed. And that is what salvation really is. That's the way that the Bible paints us the pictures. God calls everybody. The word says so often when Jesus is raised up, he'll call all men to himself. You know, uh, uh, 2 Peter 3.9 says that it's not God's will that anyone suffer, but everyone come to repentance. So this is so important that we understand that God's call is to everyone, a very few amount of people accept it, and then even fewer actually allow it to do a work in their hearts to where they're changed. Because you can go, oh, you know, I believe in Jesus, but like not mean it, not do anything about it, and just be like, oh, well, I said it, so I get to go into heaven. Like, no, the word says believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess that God raised him from the dead. And if there's no belief, and, and really what belief is, belief isn't just something that you think and go, oh, yeah, I think I agree with that. Belief is something that you walk out. And I love this because uh, Jordan Peterson, I talk about him all the time. He's the best. He says that what you believe is what you act out. That psychologically, that is the only thing you're capable of doing. If you believe something, you walk it out. And if you don't walk it out, then you really don't believe it. So what is belief in Jesus? It's living a life that would give glory to him. And we'll read a verse that puts that so beautifully uh, at the end here. Now, this word uh, uh, called, it's, it's a word uh, translated kletos. Okay, are y'all with me? Kletos. It's, it's kind of a weird word. Uh, but really, uh, the definition is, is super, super clear. It's to call, invite, to be summoned by God to an office or to salvation. So right there, God says, everyone who's called has the opportunity to accept salvation. Y'all following me? So this few are chosen part has almost nothing to do with your ability to accept salvation. It literally, the, the few are chosen part is really not about salvation. It's about what you do with what God's put in front of you. Now, then, I'm going to define this term uh, elect because I, I want to be very clear about it. Is really the elect can, can come up in our minds as like, oh, these are the saved. I don't think that at all. I think that the elect are the leaders. I think that the elect are the people who took on sonship and said, you know what, I'm going to make a point in my life to lead others to the wedding ceremony and teach them what garments to wear. That's what the elect are. And I'll prove it. Uh, right here, uh, the, the actual um, word for uh, fewer chosen here is, I, I'm probably going to butcher this word, so just bear with me, but it's eklikotos. Y'all following eklikotos? Now, what that word uh, literally translates to mean, the literal definition is chosen out of a personal preference. Now, there, there's two things here. Number one, uh, the word tells us that uh, God sees the heart and that he, he, he doesn't show partiality to anyone. So we know in regards to partiality, God doesn't play that game. So what could it mean that God chooses people out of a personal preference? 
Maybe it means that he designed you for something specific and he's chosen you for that specific thing because he prefers that what you were designed for is what you get to do. Are y'all following? Because that's like really good. That's like way better than what most people say. What this verse literally says is, many are called, few are chosen, and what they're chosen for is what I designed them to do. That's what they're chosen for. And why are so few chosen? Because so few choose to take up sonship and say, I'm going to take responsibility for what God has put in front of me. Do you want to be elect? It's very simple. Take up the sonship. But elect does not mean saved. And I'll prove it. Titus 1.1, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Now, an apostle. An apostle is what? Someone who strengthens church leaders. That's what apostles do. Apostles almost are never known for huge evangelism, huge teachings. Really, an apostle is an elder. An apostles strengthen church leaders. Matthew 24, 22. Unless those days were cut short, no one would be delivered. But for the sake of the chosen, it's the same word as elect, those days will be cut short. It's talking about the end times and those who are faithfully pursuing what God has set in front of them. God's going to cut the days of tribulation short for them. The last one is in verse 24, two verses ahead of the one we just read. And it says, For false uh, uh, Christs and false prophets will rise up and show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. It's not hard to lead a baby Christian like away. Like They'll believe almost anything. So they're like, oh, I'm fine. Like, yeah, this is great. Tell me anything, I'll believe it. The people who are hard to lead away are the ones who know the word, the ones who teach the word. Are y'all following me that this whole elect thing is really about the people who choose to take up sonship and much less to do with salvation? I'm not saying there aren't occurrences where that word pops up that seem to look more like salvation, but in this passage, that's not what it means. Now, th this is something that we so often as Christians can kind of uh, uh, make an oopsie with as we find a word and we find the definition. We go, man, this is what it means every single time it's used. But just like all language, one word used in one sentence and then in another sentence can have a different meaning. And that's why context is so important. So in this case, what's so clear is that the Lord is talking about church leaders. And it really goes past church leaders. It goes to people who have made their faith their own. That's what the Lord's talking about. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out before I go any further is we've talked about TULIP before, the, the, the five points of Calvinism. The U in TULIP is unconditional election. Essentially, the way it's described is uh, cosmic eeny, meeny, miny, mo. God basically closes his uh, mind off to the knowledge of everything that he knows and goes, I choose you, you, and you. Oh, hey, Jason made it into heaven. That's the belief. But we just read that the elect is a personal preference. So God does choose people for certain tasks that are a preference. And so it's kind of funny when you think about it is they use this word elect and then they don't even define it. And so they really don't understand what God is saying. Are y'all following me? So the elect are a personal preference. What is the personal preference? Not that he likes Nicole more than Taylor. It's that Nicole's designed for something that Taylor isn't, and Taylor's designed for something that Nicole isn't, and God wants to put you in positions where you can walk in the fullness of your gifting. That is God's desire. Ephesians 4, 19 through 24 says this, Put off your old self, which belongs to your form, former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. The man was thrown out because he didn't put it on. He didn't put on the new life God had. He didn't put on the righteousness. He didn't put on the holiness. He didn't put it on. Now, this is, this is the last verse I'm going to read. It's Philippians 1, 27 through 30. It's phenomenal. If you've never read this verse or never like reread it before, you should reread it. It says this, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, 
so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is the clear sign to them of their destruction. Can I just pause for a second? How amazing is that? When you look your enemy in the eye and say, I will not be afraid of you, that is a sign to him of his destruction. So when the enemy comes and wants to talk a big game, it's very simple. You look him dead in the eye and you tell him, I'm not interested. And he knows that it's a sure sign of his destruction. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. What is that conflict? It's between the Lord and sin. So so what are we saying here? We're saying that being a son means that you get to take up this fight that Jesus fought and that Paul fought and that the manner that you live should uh, be worthy of the gospel of Jesus. And that when you live that way, it's a sure sign to the enemy that he's going to lose. I think it's so important that we take on this idea that we are heirs, not servants. And so often we get told by people, you just need to serve. You just need to get in there and serve. Like if if you don't know what to do, just start serving. And it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to say that's like necessarily wrong, but you need to find where God's telling you to serve. And you need to ask him what obedience looks like. Because as a son, your job is not to do what all the servants do. For a time, you're going to be managed by them. That's true. But after that, what's going to come? You're going to be the heir. You're going to have a greater authority. And what God's calling you to do is to live in a manner worthy of it. So if we'd all bow our heads and close our eyes here for a minute, I just want to give us all the opportunity whether we've we've been acting like a slave or not acting enough like a son, I think all of us in at least one area have have been there. And maybe God pointed something out in the message which has nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now. And if he's talking to you about that, awesome. But no matter what, I just want you uh, to sit with him for a minute and allow him to just speak over you exactly what he has for you. You know, here in a second, we're going we're gonna to play one more song of worship. And I really just want you to look at God as your daddy. And if there is one thing that you take away from this, that is the thing. Look at God as a daddy, a good daddy, who's so excited when you start to take your first step. So God, we love you. Daddy, we love you, and we just pray right now that we would see you as the loving Father that you are. In your mighty name.